Well, hello everyone, it's time for another video about one of the museum ships I got to see on my tour in the USA. Now, of course, we did start with USS Constitution, which was slightly out of step with things because that was actually the second ship that we visited. So let's go and have a look at the first ship that we visited. As you can see here, uh, on a fine morning, the day after we'd flown into the States, I rolled up in our RV, which is what we used for the first couple of weeks of the trip, and there it is on the left, to be greeted by this lovely site. Now, to be fair, uh, my navigation skills were mediocre. So I got myself to the location that the sat-nav said Salem was at. But having followed the signage and then obviously worked my way off of the main public road system, I was now in an industrial dockyard. And, well, let's just say navigating an RV around an industrial dockyard is not something I have a great deal of life experience with. Fortunately, however, a very, very kind uh, local police officer, uh, Lieutenant Bob, managed to find us, or I think he was actually expecting us, and showed us the way. And so we managed to pull up to this rather fantastic view. There are, of course, a few small artifacts that you can have a look at at the landing stage dash parking lot before you get aboard but it wasn't too long before the staff spotted us and made us feel very welcome and brought us aboard which was really really nice of them but just before we headed aboard mrs drac found one of her relatives Hello, friend. and i thought i should probably also get a waterline shot for you this is of course uss salem a des moines class cruiser so the last heavy cruisers to be built in the USA and the last one to be preserved. The only one, in fact, to be preserved, as far as I understand. You can see she's sitting just a little bit high compared to her normal waterline load. That's why you can see the boot topping there, because, of course, she's not loaded down with ammunition and fuel. But with that external look done, it was actually time to get on board the ship. Now, this ship was a number of firsts for me. Obviously, it was one of the first, in fact, obviously the first museum ship in the USA that I had been on on this trip. And in fact, only the second museum ship in the USA I'd ever been on. I've been on USS Intrepid back when I was a teenager. But in addition, it's also the first museum ship over 10,000 ton displacement that I've been on. Well, I mean, technically Belfast is slightly over that, but... Also, technically, she's a town-class cruiser, which is technically a treaty-restricted design. Nevertheless, USS Salem is considerably larger and heavier than a 10,000-ton-ish treaty cruiser. So, at, by this point, she was also the largest museum ship I'd ever been on. Now, of course, in keeping with the principles of pretty much any of the live tours or visits aboard ship that I do, we're not going to be looking at every single aspect of what you can see aboard the Salem because the idea is you know go and have a look yourself this is a taster looking at some aspects of the Salem uh, particularly ones that I enjoyed looking at while I was there myself now of course there are a few interesting features to note just while you're walking down the side to get to the gangway first of all you can see that Salem has quite a pronounced flare on her bow this is obviously to help quite significantly with sea keeping. You can see the difference it makes in freeboard up front compared to the difference in freeboard it has at the main guns and superstructure sections of the ship. You can also see how quickly it flares out and there's a slight forward rake to it. So all of this will help the ship when it's underway at full speed to not get huge amounts of water over the bow unless the seas are very 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 rough and that's quite important doubly so not just because it's just inconvenient and you know you don't generally want to keep the sea away from you to stop you dropping speed but as we'll see in a bit when you look at the complexity of the automatic eight inch guns which you can just see there on the right well, yeah, you definitely don't want water getting into that area if you can at all avoid it. And speaking of the guns, here they are. Well, here's at least two thirds of them. The 8 inch 55 auto loading weapons, which make up the main armament of the Des Moines class and would be the only class on which this particular weapon system would be deployed. And once again, you know, these were the single largest turreted guns that I'd seen up until this point because HMS Belfast, again, being the reference for large museum ships in the UK for the most part, 
obviously has six inch guns there are 15 inch guns at the imperial war museum but they're static mounted on land not in any kind of turret whereas these are obviously part of an active ship so they look quite impressive especially when you're below them and while we're actually looking at this angle this is something that i actually noticed whilst i was in the states how impressive the ship looks to the exterior observer can in significant part actually be dictated by what kind of key side or wharf you've actually got her on and what level the viewer is relative to the ship as they approach some vessels like in this case salem you're walking near enough at sea level so you're coming in pretty much at the waterline uh, uss new jersey is like this as well quite notably as is midway and as a result you coming in as they're walking basically at sea level get to appreciate the full scale of the ship in a way that pretty much only someone who was in a dry dock could get a better view of and so it the ship appears much much larger much much more impressive than some ships which i've seen including one or two in the states where mostly by circumstance they've ended up moored next to something whereby you are a significant portion of your way up the hull when you're standing at ground level because obviously then your perspective being closer to the level of the main deck makes the ship feel smaller now obviously there's not a tremendous amount that an existing museum ship in an existing location can do about it but if you've ever been to a ship that has m multiple instances of itself in various locations and you've been to multiple ships iowas and fletchers are probably the best examples thereof and you've come away thinking well why did this one feel bigger than the other one or vice versa that's actually probably why now going slightly closer to the gangway you can also see one of the things that marks des moines out as a late generation u.s cruiser design whether that be light or heavy now you might be looking at it and thinking is it the superstructure is it the multiplicity of radars what could it be that is a generic trait of late generation US cruisers. Actually, it's that port side 5 inch 38 mount. Now, it's not necessarily the mounting itself, but where it's located. And next to the superstructure is not the answer. The answer is that, as you can see, just about it is flush with the main deck. It's not on a little pedestal, ring, mini barbette, whatever you want to call it. Now, if you look at something like, say, a Cleveland or even a Baltimore, which to be fair is a relatively late generation US heavy cruiser design, those ships have their port side anti-aircraft mounts and their starboard ones, actually. The, the, the wing mounted 5 inch 38s are sat on these little pedestal rings. That gives them slightly greater height, which is fine, and theoretically gives them slightly better arcs of fire. However, by the time that the US was designing its last generation of cruisers, the Des Moines, the Oregon City subclass of the Baltimores, the Fargo subclass of the Clevelands, etc., basically anything that was going to be armed with a 5 inch 38 mount and was a cruiser, they'd decided that actually making a few changes to the overall layout of the ship was a better way of clearing fire arcs and having the 5 inch 38s mounted a few feet higher wasn't actually helping the cause all that much but what it was doing was adding a bunch of weight to the ship and it was moving the weight of the 5 inch 38 mount itself higher in the ship which had an exponential effect on stability and so in all of those late classes and subclasses that i mentioned the 5 inch 38 mounts on the wings were put down on deck level it's a very very subtle distinction but it's one that actually provides for relatively easy reference, especially when you're looking, as I said, at a picture of Fargo or Oregon City. And if you're trying to work out, is it one of those two ships, as opposed to a Cleveland or Baltimore from an earlier period, looking at the 5 inch 38 mounts is one of the best ways of working out whether or not it's late or early. 
There is, of course, the 5-inch 38 mount sitting directly behind turret 8-2, which is a centerline mount, which means obviously you double its effectiveness. But you'll also notice, even on this, and even on a ship the size of Salem, that is actually set relatively down. Whereas if you look at some earlier US cruisers that had this kind of design, then the 5-inch 38 mount is actually set somewhat higher relative to the turret that it sits behind. Again, this is saving weight and stability. And yes, it means technically you can't fire absolutely dead ahead forward with a 5-inch 38. But, well, if you're firing at a surface target dead ahead, that's what your big guns are for. So it doesn't actually manifestly make the fire arcs of that gun and its effectiveness in anti-aircraft roll any worse. And by lowering it, it also means the superstructure can be built slightly lower, which again saves on weight and stability. So you can make an awful lot of change to ship design by very small incremental differences. Now, of course, as we step on board, you can also see that Salem mounts another kind of secondary anti-aircraft weapon. That is the three inch automatic system seen here in a twin mounting that's just above the five inch 38 mounting. Now this shows just where Salem is in the grand scheme of evolving anti-aircraft systems just after the second world war. The five inch 38 is still an entirely valid system but what you'll notice as you go around Salem, unlike almost every other World War II era preserved warship of the United States Navy, is a distinct absence of numerous 20mm and 40mm anti-aircraft guns. That's not to say she didn't have a few when she was originally launched, but by the time she was fully in service and moving her way around the world, it was appreciated that by and large the 20 and 40mm had had their day. The 20mm had displaced the machine gun because the machine gun could no longer reach out far enough or hit hard enough. The 40mm over the course of World War II had actually come up to pretty much supplant after complementing the Orlikan 20mm for pretty much the same reason. Aircraft had gotten faster, tougher and were dropping their weapons from further out so the 20mm had gone from a relatively viable point defense weapon to a weapon that could only affect enemy aircraft after they dropped their weapons to potentially with the advent of longer range torpedo drops and guided weapons perhaps even a weapon that couldn't affect enemy aircraft at all and by the end of the war even the 40mm was beginning to suffer from this and after the war the 40mm definitely suffered from that Basically, if an aircraft wanted to come really, really close and do a manual bomb drop on you, then the 40mm was still entirely valid. But if the enemy was going to do anything else, like use one of the new guided weapons, any kind of rocket or standoff weapon, or even uh, an aerial torpedo drop, although that was also relatively rapidly going out of fashion, they could do that beyond the range of the 40mm. And in fact, most of them could also pull away from their attack runs outside of the range of the 40 mil. The 3 inch, however, could reach out to whatever ranges most of these weapons were being dropped at, could fire at a relatively high rate of fire, indeed this is an auto-loading variant, and because it was a 3 inch shell it carried a fair bit of stopping power, especially armed with a proximity fuse. The 5 inch 38 could do almost all of these things, but it couldn't compete with a 3 inch in terms of sheer weight of shells being thrown down range. The rate of fire of an automatic 3 inch compared to a manually fed 5 inch 38, yeah, there's just no real comparison. But the 5 inch 38 shell itself is still somewhat heavier and somewhat longer range than the 3 inch, and so both of these systems were interleaved on the Des Moines class. With the continuing evolution of radar, which had started at the beginning of World War II and was obviously going strong well after it, even these two weapons were looking like they were going to be supplanted in fairly short order. The US had a longer barrel 5-inch gun, which could obviously reach out further, but also there were experiments with the earliest surface-to-air missiles. So the 5-inch 38 and the 3-inch automatic are very much 1940s to early 1950s weapons, and that's exactly the era that Salem comes from. 
Now, the other thing, as we head into Turret 8.2, that I have to mention is that Salem was also the first example I received of the massive hospitality of US museum ships and Salem's crew in particular. Bearing in mind that when I've been to most UK museum ships, I either just rock up there as a regular visitor and do a bit of filming, or in the case of places like Unicorn or for specific stuff that I've done like Warrior, I've you know written to them and said, I'd like to film on your ship. Uh, thank you very much, and so on and so forth, and then off I go. Um, going into the US, I had no real idea of what to expect in sort of my reasonable ideal term thinking i was imagining people would say yep hello welcome aboard film where you like and let us know if there's anything interesting you'd like to look at that's behind a hatchway or something and if we can get you in there then we will that was kind of my what i was hoping to get but i was actually going to get a whole lot more um, as we will see something for which i am of course profoundly grateful now one of the first things i noticed going into tara 82 compared to going into is that again i'm not going to use this as a very common point of reference because at the time that i'd done this particular ship visit it was my only point of reference hms belfast's six inch turrets is there's an awful lot of machinery in this turret lots of very complicated buttons and dials and switches and telephones and all sorts whereas if you've ever been in one of belfast turrets basically all of this kind of stuff is located around a single chair at the back of the turret uh, as you can see there's a little safety rail to stop you just wandering into the area where the guns themselves are and there's a little warning warnings rigged sign there because of course turrets don't have windows so that's up there ostensibly to tell the gun crew if the ship's still in service that hey we've got our sun warnings up please don't fire the guns because you'll ruin them all oh and this is also actually another difference compared to the interior of a light cruiser turret there is actually a degree of physical division between the aft end of the turret and the bit of the turret where all the guns themselves are and in something else that's also unbelievably advanced for its time there's even this little fire control device. Yes, this is an electromechanical computer, uh, obviously connected up to primary fire control as well. But um, yeah, on a lot of ships in World War II, you'd be counted as lucky to have something about this complex on the ship at all. Whereas in Salem, this is sitting inside the turret and presumably can act as a backup for the backup for the backup for the backups. For the backups, for the redundancies, for the backups for the reserves for the backups which are they're all there just in case the primary fire control system is taken out and if you think i'm kidding oh no no i'm not you'll see that as well later so looking into the forward part of the turret you can see here two of the three main guns the third one's there just over to the right and this is again another thing that actually not only is the difference between salem and belfast but also difference between salem and practically any other gun armed ship in the world that you can go and have a look at as a museum ship and yes that even includes the battleships if you've been on an iowa south dakota or north carolina class museum ship even their gun areas won't look as complicated as this because of course in all of those other ships the loading is still manually done with power assistance whereas on salem the ship's primary weapon system is almost fully automatic and i say almost because we'll see where the human element comes in a little bit later now of course there are areas where human elements can come in and either repair control or take over at various points in the system but in theory if everything's working as intended there is in fact only one area of the ship's entire primary weapon system where humans are absolutely needed uh, apart from obviously telling it where to point now something the eagle-eyed amongst you might have spotted that is different from practically every other preserved gun armed warship on the planet is that there's no interrupted screw breech block so how on earth is the gun being made safe to fire well these guns use a sliding breech block now generally speaking for manually loaded guns the interrupted screw block is a much better option the 
only major power to really go ham on sliding breech blocks as late as World War II for their battleships, cruisers, etc. In ter terms of main battery guns were the Germans, and that's mainly because Krupp just refused to move on from the sliding breech block. But in the Des Moines class, the 8-inch guns are sliding rather than interrupted screw. Now, why is this, and why are the Salem's turrets not absolutely gigantic the way that Bismarck or Hipper's turrets had to be to account for the extra width needed for the sliding breech block? Well, the why is because the sliding breech block was rotated 90 degrees, so it is a vertical sliding breech block rather than a horizontal one. And therefore, you don't need to move the guns further apart to account for the breech block coming all the way across the way that you do in the German ships, because the breech block just moves up towards the turret ceiling and then drops back down again. As for why this whole approach was adopted, well, again, this ship's systems are almost entirely automated, and it's much, much easier to automate a single movement breech block that just goes up, down, up, down, up, down, as it would be compared to trying to automate something that had to open a certain precise number of degrees, rotate, open, obviously you admit the shell, then close again to a precise number of degrees, and then rotate and turn again to a precise number of degrees to lock it in. It's also quicker when you're, once it's an automated process to just do the up-down. The third issue is, of course, that Salem's guns are designed to be loaded at near enough all angles, and in that respect, the vertical sliding breech block actually has far less complicated forces acting on it than a swinging interrupted screw breech would, and all of this contributes to rate of fire and reliability. So that's why Salem's guns use the sliding as opposed to the interrupted screw breech block. And then it was time for all of us, including the feet of the intrepid cameraman, to navigate along this narrow little walkway between two of the guns, which also afforded a better look at some of the various complex bits of machinery that were installed around the guns to facilitate the auto-loading and elevating sequences, which, of course, is what increases the weight of the turret, because the Des Moines carry the same notional armament of 9-8 inch guns as their Baltimore class predecessors, but on a significantly heavier hull. And the mountings, the gun turrets themselves, weigh considerably more as in addition. And this is usually just said to be, yeah, it's a result of the automated firing system. Yes, this is true, but it's only once you're actually in the turret itself, and as we'll see a bit further beyond, that you begin to appreciate where all this extra weight has come from, because all of this is not present on practically any other ship in its main battery turrets. Because, as again, those ships aren't automated, and all this machinery that helps move the turret and the gun around and get it fired, loaded, aimed and fired again, is, to a significant degree, being done just by humans with some power assistance and buttons. But then I turn around and the next thing I know, one of the staff has disappeared. And I'm thinking, okay, uh, what goes, is going on? And then I'm told, no, no, you need to follow him. At which point, there I go on the left, to rather gracefully making my way across a gun down into a hatchway that was so small I hadn't even noticed it was there before. Uh, this is not a hatchway that the crew have installed post-fact. This is, was actually built into the ship's design to allow elements of Salem's crew in wartime to transit up and down through the ship systems, but it wasn't a access way that was designed for regular use. It would have been probably made just a fraction more accessible if it had. Uh, this was basically a if-you-need-to-use-it route. Um, and given that, as we've just been saying, the ship's systems in this area are highly automated, you shouldn't be needing to use it all that often. But it does mean that we could go down. Now, unfortunately, being such a narrow hatchway, it meant that I could go down and rely on my phone camera, but anything bigger than that couldn't follow. So this is where the cameraman had to go off and entertain himself for a bit. You know, I've heard a saying something along the lines of become the light you want to see, uh, at which point this photo would become evidence that apparently the light that I want to see dash become is a rather bright light shining up out of the abyss to scare cameramen who have no idea what it is or where it's coming from. But that's just me. Anyway, 
Where we found ourselves after going down a short ladder was in the gun pit directly underneath the guns. And yes, some of these pictures are in portrait. No, that's not because I forgot what landscape is. It's simply because some of these have to be taken in portrait to capture all the detail with the field of view that I had on the lens. Now, again, all of this is not stuff you will find in a normal gun pit. A normal gun pit on a normal ship is pretty much what it sounds like. It's a big void space underneath the main level of the guns, which exists so that the breech end of the gun can lower, so that the bat, most of the barrel can go up, and so that the gun can therefore elevate, it can fire, and the gun pit spaces exist basically to facilitate that elevation and the recoil, and then the gun will return to some kind of lower angle for reloading. If it's a particularly large gun pit, you might see evidence of the reloading systems themselves, but that's usually about it. Whereas, as you can see here, whilst, yes, the ammunition hoist systems are, do come up through here, there is even more complex and wonderful machinery, including an awful lot of copper piping. And all of this, again, is part of the system that allows the ship to fire fully automatically. You need electrical generators, so therefore you need motors, you need hydraulic lines, you need things to cool down, all of that, and once you've got the heat immediately away from the things that might be overheating, you need air coolers and heat exchangers to dump that heat elsewhere, and you need all the mechanical systems that those motors and electrical generators, etc. might be powering, and you can see some of those in the background, all of the stuff that's going to move the turrets, elevate the turrets, move the shells, move the hoists, and of course the hoists themselves have to stick with the guns as they move, so that's a whole extra degree of complication that again most other ships don't have, and all of this has to happen in perfect synchronicity. And so you have stuff like this cropping up. This is just one motor. There are another two identical to it because each of these supplies part of the power for a single gun. And obviously there are hydraulic accumulators that need power and pumps to move all the fluid around and etc. and so forth. And it was only really at this point that I began to appreciate fully just how much of a technical achievement this particular turret and the other two aboard the ship were. Because, you know, again, this would normally just be a void space that's there to help with some fairly basic tasks of firing the ship's guns. Whereas here, it's a veritable warren of cabling, piping, motors, ducts, accumulators, pressure regulator vessels, valves. And all of it has to run automatically whilst subjected to the repeated and regular shocks of several heavy caliper guns firing basically right next to it all without breaking. Um, over here you can see one of the guide ra rails for the gun as it comes down. In some ways we're relatively lucky that the automatic 8-inch system was only ever used on the Des Moines class because as later experience on the various other US museum ships would, te would tell us and I'm sure many of those of you who have been in the US Navy know well, ships in mothballs tend to get raided for spare parts, and this system, if there had been newer ships in service using the same gun system, this system would have been ripped out or cannibalized long ago for those spares, and it therefore wouldn't be in place for engineers like myself to look at and wonder at today. And there's absolutely no way that you'd on a museum ship budget be rebuilding all of this from scratch um, there is just so much to look at take in and learn and again this is just one part this is probably about one third of the systems underneath one gun in a triple turret so there's about nine times as much machinery just in this space as you can see in this picture and then multiply that across the other three, three other, well, other two turrets of the three. Uh, down there on the left, the big silvery thing you can see, that is the stop for the gun as it comes down to, you know, say no further than this. But the fact that it's almost, not quite, but almost horizontal and so far down tells you just how high up the 8-inch uh, 55 guns could actually elevate. And the funny thing is, in the midst of all of this... Uh, 
rather wonderfully complex machinery. There's also some really old school stuff that looks like it came straight out of the 19th century. Over here on the left, for example, you can see a giant uh, rack and pinion set. And that, again, is part of the ship's elevation mechanism for the guns. So that's you know, how the guns are pointed up and down. Because, well, why not? If it ain't broke, don't, don't fix it. <laughs> so there's a very complicated series of motors which are driving it but the actual rotation mechanism is just a nice big lump of iron. Now, off there just to the left, you see there's a little hatchway. Now, if we were crew during the ship's regular service and the ship was um, in a battle and we were down here for whatever reason, maybe doing maintenance to one of the many, many, many valves or pipes, this area off to the left would be our battle station because the area where we're filming, or where I'm taking all the pictures from, whilst it's great for getting a view of the machinery, is in a direct path of the breech end of the guns. So standing where I'm standing right now, this is just under the port side gun, would be a death sentence in an actual battle, because if the ship had to fight any kind of significant range, well, the breech would just come down and squash me like a small bug. None of this complicated copper piping includes any kind of proximity sensor for squishy humans. Now, going even further down through other secret paths takes us straight down to the shell room. And, uh, well, in classic style, I absolutely love this. Do not place hands in hoist. You know, just in case you don't want your hands hoisted up and fed into an automatic 8-inch gun. But, as with all sorts of other silly rules, the fact that this sign is in place probably means at some point somebody thought it was a good idea to feed their hands into a shell hoist and presumably regretted it somewhat later on. Now, you might notice that there's a red section on the right there, a grey section on the left, and this middle bit, which is both grey and red. Well, that's because all of this can rotate. This is still you know, within the barbette, so the shell hoists are next to the guns. They have to stay next to the guns, so if the turret rotates, the guns rotate, the shell hoist go with them, but you don't want the shell hoist flailing around inside the magazine, just smacking things left, right and centre, and so everything is on these rings, which means that the shell hoist goes around, everyone can see where it's going round, and it can be built so that, you know, there aren't things in the way, but on either side there are shell racks, so the agent shells can be loaded. And it's down here that the human element I mentioned earlier comes in, because these shells are quite heavy, and they're mounted in the static part of the barbette. There, you can see a dummy round on the right. But whilst the system from here on up is all automated, the actual process of selecting the shell, feeding the shell into the hoist, and then sending it on its way, that is where the human element comes in. So the guns will quite happily keep firing as long as someone's pointing them in the right direction and pressing the fire button, but they'll only do so as long as the human crew down here are feeding shells and charges up. Now, you may have noticed this thing sitting there just above it. That is not, in fact, something from the 17th century. We don't need to check that this is an 8-inch shell or that the tolerances are wide enough, but it is a very useful thing to collar a shell up top and allow you to maneuver it a bit more easily. Um, so that's what it's there for. Now, of course, the question is, how do you get the 8-inch shells into the hoists quickly enough? Because even on their own without the charge, those shells are quite heavy. They're not, there's, you know, they're not the weight of a 5-inch 38 shell, which is heavy enough, but can still just about be man-portable to be chucked into hoists or chucked into a gun fast enough to keep up a fairly impressive rate of fire. You know, this is a substantially heavier projectile. You aren't going to be doing this with manpower for any sustained length of time unless you really, really like losing men to fatigue or accidents and not having a reliable, consistent rate of fire anyway. Well, part of the solution is that even down here in the shell room, there's an awful lot of automation and power control as well. And an awful lot of communications equipment so that you can let people up top know what's going on down here, and they can let you know what they want if the ship's in battle. But as you can see here, the process for actually grabbing an 8-inch shell and sticking it in the hoist is controlled by this claw-type device. And there you, go, you kick the shell in, and off it would go. 
fairly simple little piece of lever action technology that actually makes life so so much easier for everybody obviously again the deck would be fairly smooth and probably lightly greased which would help the shell slide around but just that little bit of mechanical assistance vastly increases the apparent strength and therefore speed and reliability of the crew and you know given that they're going to be chucking shells up there as fast as the guns can fire them and the guns can fire them pretty darn quickly they need every bit of help that they can get now descending even further into the ship and we're in the magazines where the charges are loaded and once again someone had to put a sign because yes the scuttle will for the charges will also take your hands so do not feed your hands to the scuttle god it will not repay you now the super heavy ap round is 335 pounds so you can understand why you need mechanical assistance for that the charge however is well under a third of that weight it's actually under 100 pounds even accounting for the case that it comes in but of course the shells are pretty inert until they're fired or subjected to massive massive trauma the charges are the weak spot you know that's how ships blow up so how do you stop a potential hit to the turret which would then potentially travel straight down these trunks straight into this uh charge handling area how do you would you prevent that or an accidental explosion in the turret itself from detonating the magazine well the thing is we are not in the magazine we're in uh, a shell handling room what divides this off from the magazine are these these are rotating flash tight doors and as you can see there there's a wooden dummy charge sitting in the right hand one and this is what allows you to have the charges stored in the ma actual magazine area and then be transported to the other side of one of these placed into the charge handling room and then from here they are transported to the scuttle which will then put them in the hoist which will then take them up to the guns to be fired i mean so this as well as the bulkhead and the safety sign which yes is from the bureau of ordnance but is actually quite a useful little primer on how and why you should keep all your ammunition safe and secure should work to keep everything safe and to prevent any flash or anything from traveling into the magazines now here's the magazine side of those self-same rotating doors and here's one of the magazine storage racks themselves so you can see there would have been quite a lot of stuff stored on here and once you've taken off a row of charges you can then just take off that divider strip to access the next lot and there would be more of those in here as well now when you're moving the charges around they still you know push nearly 100 pounds so you have this little cart to help you move them around and the floor obviously would have been lined in service uh, to prevent any sparks or anything like that so that's perfectly fine so you take your charge over and put it through now yes there are some pipes and therefore some piercings in the magazine but these are all carrying water these are various fire mains and so forth plus of course a few power cables for the lights but that's all there's no air ventilation ducts etc that could carry flash or sparks or fumes in here so how do you keep the magazine cool because you do have to keep it cool to stop the propellant denaturing early and also differences in initial propellant temperature can affect the ballistics of the shell well these racks of fins are the magazine's cooling systems a little bit like the systems you see on some lower end pcs where they don't have fans they just use racks of fins to conduct the heat away from a cpu this is kind of that but in reverse where instead of the fins conducting heat away from the cold water supply that cools them they are instead conducting cool so they are radiating coolness and theoretically absorbing heat which they then take away and this means you don't have any hvac system that could potentially be compromised further up the line and allow fire etc in and of course in the event of a fire in the magazine an hvac system that was feeding cold air in would be feeding oxygen to the fire this doesn't do so now take a quick look at those interlock systems in operation as you can see you only need to rotate it through 180 degrees but thanks to the way that they're engineered at no point is there a direct air connection between the magazines and the shell handling space but it also makes it much easier to very quickly and efficiently pass through the charges now emerging back out from the magazines 
a whole ton of people had apparently turned up to look at number three turret. And then, of course, they all said they'd come to see me, which was very interesting. And thanks very much for showing up, everyone. It was great fun chatting to you. Um, but obviously, I'm not about to start splashing your faces all over the channel without permission. So here's a pretty picture of some of the radar arrays instead. Now, following that chat, we actually ended up going back down into the ship and looking an awful lot more at the ship's fire control and radar systems. Uh, during this entire period, as we were accompanied by a couple of the Salem's crew who, as I said, absolutely wonderful people. They let me in. They gave me a very detailed tour, um, told me how all the various things worked. And, of course, uh, Dr. Scholes, who would also accompany me on USS Massachusetts, what he doesn't know about US fire control systems isn't worth knowing. Um, I'm hoping at some point to get him actually on the channel to talk about them, which is why, apart from time reasons for this video, I'm not going to go into everything we saw on Salem's fire control systems today, other than to say that, you know, they're incredibly impressive. Um, and I hope you'll share that opinion when we see them in, again, another video. And by the time we'd finished looking at all of those systems, it was actually time for the ship to start closing. So after taking a few more photos, we decamped and uh, waved goodbye to our first US museum ship of the tour, having made, hopefully, quite a few new friends. And once again, you know, not just to Dr. Skulls and the other uh, docents and crew who accompanied us down there, but to the entire USS Salem crew who made us feel incredibly welcome on what was, after all, the Oak Grand opening day for Salem for the 2022 season. Thank you so much. It was an absolutely fantastic start to the trip. Um, I hope this small excerpt of what's on offer has tempted you to go and have a look at USS Salem, for uh, regular viewers. Definitely please do so. Um, they do need all the help they can get. <laughs> it's not their fault they're stuck in the middle of an industrial dock area, and the ship is hugely, hugely interesting for any naval historian or anyone interested in naval history generally. But of course, on the way out, I spotted some Gate Guardian shells. And, well, I found a shell as big as me. Well, actually slightly taller than me, because it's, uh, it's a 16-inch shell. So, what do we do when we find a big shell? We punch it. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.